ended up deriving in Chapter 5 using the Reynolds Transport Theorem with energy. This is one form of the equation. In this form of the equation, now let's just go through it. The left hand side of the equation is all the energy provided to the fluid. So first of all, we have the energy of the fluid when it comes in to the control volume. That's this. Okay. Plus, we add energy to the fluid from a pump, if we have a pump. That's equal to the energy going out of the control volume, location two. Plus a turbine work, because a turbine takes energy out of the fluid. Plus the losses, because the losses take energy out of the fluid. So this is the available energy. We add energy for a pump. We take energy out from the turbine. This is what leaves the control volume. And the losses take energy out of the fluid. All the units in there, every term in there, every term, the loss term, the W dot T, the W dot P, the M dot G times Z1, all those guys are either in Newton meters per second or British gravitational pound foot per second. Those guys are in power because a Newton meter is a joule. A joule per second is a watt. These guys are typically in kilowatts. Pump power, turbine power. These guys are in pound feet per second. But that can be converted into horsepower. So the pump could be horsepower. W dot turbine could be horsepower. Now we had two other equations uh, that we also looked at. One of them, oh, I'll just do the one that um, the head form the equation. This is the head form of the energy equation. We use gamma rather than rho now. H sub T, the turbine head. H sub L is the loss head. <clears throat> Everything is in meters or feet. This guy is in kilowatts or horsepower when, once you convert it. So you pick out the equation that you need. If the problem gives you the power in horsepower of a pump or a turbine, I'd probably use this one. You'll see in homework. If the problem gives you the losses in terms of feet of head, I would use this one because the losses are in feet of head. So it depends how the problem is stated to you, which equation you might want to use. But they're equivalent. They're, they're the same thing. OK. There's three equations in your notes from last time. I put two back on the board here for you. The third one's in your notes. And we worked an example problem uh, last time. So you have problem 110 and 113 for Homer. Let me just do problem uh, 5112. It's in the middle of the two for Homer. 5112. So we have uh, uh, this could be a lake, and then there's this is how the picture looks. Looks something like this. At the bottom here, there is a, a turbine. Uh, and let's see, one meter in diameter, yeah, one meter in diameter, and the velocity is six meters per second, leaving the turbine. <coughs> and this diameter is one meter. Let's see if that picture in the textbook looks somewhat like what I've got on the board there. One twelve. Yeah, okay. Turbine, six meters, okay. 50 meters from the free surface down. So 50 meters down. Uh, 
Okay, and this is a lake or something atmosphere here. And the problem says, what's the maximum power output uh, of the uh, of the turbine? So, what is the maximum power output? Okay, so if I want power output, I would probably use this guy because these terms are in power. So I'm going to use that one. Okay. M dot. P over row. V1 squared over 2. GZ1. There's no pump, so drop the HP term out. Or W dot P. Drop out W dot P. Equal M dot P2 over rho. V2 squared over 2, G, Z, 2, plus W dot turbine, get it through the turbine, leave it in. And of course, if somebody asks you for the maximum work output of the turbine, they mean the losses would be zero. So far, max power output losses will be equal to zero. Okay, so there it is. Now you have to pick out where point one and point two are. If you want to draw a control volume, you can. You don't have to necessarily. Don't forget the, the energy equation is sometimes called a, the uh, modified probability equation. So you know, if you want, you can go ahead and put point one up here and point two down here. P1 atmospheric, zero. V1, zero. Z1, 50. So 50 G, and that's equal to uh, our M dot, let's put our M dot. M dot rho A V and uh, here equal M dot rho A V. Uh, P2 goes out to atmosphere, I'll put atmosphere. The, the picture didn't show that, but you know it the turbine exhaust out to a, the stream river down here. So it's out to atmosphere. V2 uh, uh, is six given to us. So we have V2 uh, squared over two. G, uh, Z2 is zero. My datum is at the turbine. So Z2 is zero and uh, Z1 is 50 and plus W dot turbine. Do I know rho? Yes, yeah, it's water, it's a thousand, it's a thousand. Do I know the velocity? Yes, yeah, it's six. Do I know the area? Yes, yeah, it's pi d squared divided by four, pi divided by four. Do I know G? Yes, yeah, 9.81. <clears throat> Problem solved. W dot turbine max. That's max. Is uh, 2.22 2.22 megawatts. That V in the mass flow rate is that same V as V2. Okay. 
Because where do, where do I find the mass flow rate? Where the stuff leaves. So that B is that B. That A is A2. Okay, so that's the simple case where the losses are zero. When the losses are zero, it makes life easy. Yeah. So what happened to that down? Oh, oh. <laughs> Which one? This guy. Uh, okay, the GZ is there. Oh yeah, we have the, the B2 uh, leave in there, don't we? Wait, I got there, there. Which one are you talking about now? M dot. Oh, the M dot. <laughs> oh, okay, got it, got it, got it, thank you. Thank you. And that is plus times W dot T. Didn't change the answer though, I just read quote after thank you. Though. Okay, so that, that's about, about the simplest you can get. Nothing in the real world has a loss is equal to zero. Thermodynamics, you can't have 100% efficiency. So we know that's, but sometimes people ask you, well, what's the maximum you can get out? You're the engineer, tell me, what's the maximum? We engineers know you can't get that maximum, but it's nice to know what the maximum is. So that's why sometimes this little game is important. It gives you the maximum you could hope for. You'd hope for 2.22 megawatts. You're not going to get it, but how close can you get it? Well, you've got to consider losses for that. Uh -huh. Kind of a dumb question, but uh, so V2 would be 6 meters per second. What about V? What about that? Well, which one? V. In that term, there's V and then there's V2. That's right. So what would V be? The, the terms A and V or M dot? Here's where that V would be where you want to find that M dot. So you tell me, where do you want to find M dot? Look at the picture. Where would you find M dot? Up here at the free surface of, of Lake Havasu? Are done at the turbine exit. Oh, at the turbine exit. So it's the same. What? What's the mass flow right here? Does, does the yeah. level of Lake Havasu drop? Of course it does. Mm -hmm. How much? I don't know. A quarter of an inch? A one inch? In an hour? Do we know that? We don't know that. So what do we take? Where we know it. And where do we know it? At the turbine exit. If you want, don't forget. This is a control line. All right. Go ahead and draw your control line. Now, up here, take row AV. Row AV right here. What's the area? I don't know how big Lake Havasu is. Times the velocity, the lake is dropping. Really, really, really small. Do I know that? No. Do I know the area here? Yes. Do I know the velocity here? Yes. Take this one. We know that lake is really dropping a little bit. You know, but we're not going to look at that lake because that lake is a lot of uncertainty. We know what's going on at the turbine exit. That's why we look at the turbine exit. The velocity in m dot then is the velocity at the turbine exit. All right, five one twenty three. Five one twenty three. Okay, so five one twenty three. Let's look at the picture in the textbook here. Okay. Water is to be moved from one large <coughs> reservoir to another at a higher elevation as indicated by the picture. I'm going to just make the picture look like this. Mm -hmm. That's essentially how the picture looks. Uh, and of course, we're pumping the water out of the lower reservoir to the upper reservoir, 50 feet difference. Inside diameter pipe. Eight inch diameter pipe. 
the losses, he, he tells us where uh, points one and point two are. So the losses from point one to point two, there's point one. There's point two. Oh, it's not there. Point two. So, losses, uh, H sub L, 61, B squared over 2. Okay. Okay, let's see. Okay. Find the shaft power required to do this. So find the pump power. What's the maximum power output? Problem 112. We chose the power form of the energy equation. What's the pump power required? We want to find the power form of the energy equation. Nobody asked us to find the head of the turbine or the head of the pump. So this one's probably not the one you want to use. That's the one you want to use. Okay, let's start up here again. On free surface one, pressure zero, velocity zero, Z zero. HP, W dot P. There's no term. W dot T, zero. Reservoir two, oh, pressure two, atmosphere zero. Uh, B2, uh, zero. Plus losses. <clears throat> okay, Z2, uh, 50. So W dot pump is equal to uh, M dot uh, times G Z2 plus losses. Now, he told me that the losses are 61 V squared. second is Q. That's how much it's water. That's how much water you want to pump from the lower reservoir to the upper reservoir. 2.5 cubic feet per second. M dot is rho times Q. Plus 61 V squared over 2, where V equal Q over A. Okay. Do I know rho? A thousand. Do I? Not a thousand in this case. Put in slugs. We're in British computational now. Slugs. Do I know rho? Yes. Do I know Q? Given. Do I know G? 32.2. Do I know Z2? Yeah, 50. Got it. Do I know Q? Yes. Do I know A? Pi over 4 D squared. I know D. Got it. Got it. Everything is known. Put it all in there and you get 28 horsepower. Conversion factor. This guy's going to come up to be foot pounds per second. 
foot-pounds per second, okay? Um, remember, remember again, what's this guy here? This guy here is square feet per, feet square per second squared. Okay? That's the same thing as foot-pounds per second. Okay? Divide that number you get up here, divide this number here by 550. Be careful too, don't get confused. There's two HP, and boy, you better watch your P's and Q's. Because one stands for horsepower, one stands for head. You better make sure you know what, what the subscript, what not the subscript. H sub P is the pump head. HP stands for horsepower, so just be careful, it can be confusing again when you're under stress of the exam. Okay. okay, so he gave us the losses. Nobody gives you the losses. You're the engineer. You're supposed to find that. And we'll do that in about 10 days or so. So we'll find those losses. But for right now, in Chapter 5, they're really nice to you. They tell you what the losses are. But in Chapter 8, you're expected to find those losses based on things like what kind of pipe is that? PVC or commercial steel? Or maybe galvanized iron? How long is the pipe? Maybe 10 meters? Maybe 50 meters? What's the pipe diameter? Maybe 4 centimeters? Maybe 1 meter? All those things add up to this guy right here. That loss term. You think the losses in galvanized iron are greater than PVC? Of course they are. You know that. They're smooth. PVC is smooth. Galvanized iron is rough. The loss in a smaller pipe per foot is bigger than the loss in a bigger pipe. So all those things affect the losses in a piping system. What's the pipe made of? How long is the pipe? Do you think a one mile piece of pipe has more uh, loss than a one foot piece? Of course it does. You know it's common sense. So yeah, all those things add to losses. Are there right angle bends in there? Uh, is there a swing check valve in there? Is a gate valve in there? Half open. All those things add up on the losses. So, we're going to find out in about 10 to 14 days how we find an equation like that, where it comes from. So, but right now, though, it's given to you, typically. What was the first problem given to you? The losses were zero. You had to understand that. Maximum power output. What if, what if this problem here says, what is the minimum pumping required? The word minimum. That means the losses are zero. Minimum. What the problem says, the maximum turbine output. Losses are zero. But notice the word minimum and maximum. The minimum pump power required would be no losses. The maximum turbine output would be with no losses. But the word minimum and maximum mean something. Okay, so that's what your homework is all about, and uh, that's what's going to be due on. Uh, pretty much on uh, Wednesday, except for the first two problems that are in this set, the last two problems in this set right here. Okay, so anything on that right now other than what's up there? Okay, there. If you work for Newley's, this is, this is a pretty simplistic next step forward. You throw really two terms in, power terms and losses. That's all you do is, that's why it's called a modified for Newley. It's, not totally new to you. Okay, now, as we said, that pretty much is going to be the end of chapter uh, five. Okay? That's right. Anna. Just uh, before we move on, uh, for energy equation, like, we account for the pump and the right? And we, so we had lots of, but for shaft work, we'd actually subtract lots of this, this where? Is, in where? No, we uh, do shaft work. I mean, it's just in my notes. This, this is shaft work here. Oh. This, this, this is work for time. So that's what we're looking at, right? Because mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it might be wrong in my notes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> this is shaft work. Work is Newton meters. Yeah. Work is pound feet. Force times distance. Force times distance divided by time is power. Okay. Losses are the losses in the piping network connecting points one and point two in my diagram set. How many elbows are there? 
How long is this pipe? What's this pipe's diameter? What's this pipe made out of? All that stuff there goes into this loss term right here. This loss term. Okay, we're going to briefly touch on chapter six before we get into the last chapter in our course, which is chapter eight. We cover that after the midterm. All right, so let's take a look at the first part of chapter six. We go back to conservation of mass. In differential form. We start out with a small element of the fluid. The element is dx length in the x direction and dy in the y direction. Okay. Uh, in the middle, the velocity is assumed to be u in the x direction, v in the y direction. We talked about little u, little v. On this side, we have mass coming in. Here, we assume mass going out. At the bottom, we assume mass comes in. We assume mass goes out. We're looking at the mass that goes in and out of this small little element of fluid, dx by dy. What comes in the left? Rho times u minus, because we went in the minus x direction, minus partial rho u with respect to x times dx over 2. I'll explain just a minute, so hang on until I explain it. Rho u plus now. We went to the right, so it's plus. Now we do the bottom. of mass in simplistic terms. This is dm dt. What it says in words is the time rate of change of mass in that little element is equal to the amount of mass that came in minus the amount of mass that went out. So, what is this rho times u? Okay, rho, what is m dot? Okay, m dot rho a v. So if I multiply density times velocity, that's a big part of the m dot, so this right here, what comes in, if I multiply it by the area that it comes in, this is the amount of mass that comes in in the x direction. This is the amount of mass that comes in in the y direction. Both those terms are those two guys right there. The mass that goes out, out the top, out the right. Those two guys right there, these guys over here. Don't forget, now this is the velocity u in the middle. What's the velocity u on my left fingertip? Well, how far did I go in the x direction? minus dx over 2. This is dx. How far did I go over? Minus direction. dx over 2. Right there. dx over 2. So, partial of rho u with respect to x multiplied by how far I go over in the x direction gives me the value where my fingertip is now. 
This gives me the value of mass flow rate where my fingertip is here, and so on and so on. This gives me this, this gives me this. Okay, so that's where these terms come from. Okay. We don't know which way the mass is flowing. We do it general. We just do it in the general, general terms. It'll come out in the wash when we're done. Okay, so let's go ahead and plug in here now DMDT. DDT. Okay, the mass inside of there is rho dx dy. Now I'm going to assume, to make things simple, that it's one unit into the blackboard. One unit in here. So what's the volume? Into the blackboard, one times dx times dy. That's the volume. One times dx dy. This is the volume. Multiply the volume by the density, and what do you get? The mass. This is the rate of change of mass in that little element with respect to time. How did it change? Well, some stuff came in. Okay, here it is. That stuff came in. So, here is what came in. Rho u over there, minus partial rho u with respect to x. Multiply by dx over 2. How big is that area over here? Don't forget, I need to put the area in because the mass flow rate is rho times v times a. There's rho times velocity. What's the area? dy times 1 out here. 1 times dy. We won't show the 1 in here, so it's dy. Okay, that's one term. What else comes in? Down there at the bottom comes in. Plus, at the bottom, rho v. Minus partial rho v with respect to y times dy over 2. Okay, what's the area that that comes in from my fingertips. dx times what? 1 out from the blackboard. dx times 1. So multiply this guy by dx. These two terms are the mass that comes in. Now the mass that goes out, this one and this one. So when it goes out, minus sign right here, minus the mass that goes out. Rho u. Partial rho u. Same area. Uh, that's a, yeah, a minus here too. Minus rho v. That area. That's y, that's x. That's this one up here. Plus sign, plus sign. Okay, simplify these guys right here. I'll tell you one right here. Here's a row u, here's a minus row u. Here's a plus rho v, there's a minus rho v. Cancel them out. So you simplify it to get this. simplify that if we say that the flow is incompressible, density is a constant, pull the density outside the partial side, and then divide through this, it's not changing with time, so it's zero over here. First of all, make that guy zero. Now pull row outside and divide through by row. 
multiply through by minus one, and you end up with That's the conservation of mass written in two-dimensional terms. If you've got a 3D case, you just add one more term, partial W with respect to Z. What does that mean? That means at any point in the flow field, in, in an incompressible flow field, at any point in the flow field, for an incompressible fluid, under steady state conditions, this thing must be satisfied when you take the partial of u with respect to x and add it to the partial of v with respect to y, you better get zero or you haven't satisfied conservation of mass. Where does this apply? At every point in the flow field. At every point in the flow field, it has to be satisfied. So if we had that picture like this and then there's some thing like this and so on and so forth. I don't care where that point is in the flow field. At every one of those points in the flow field, that thing's got to be satisfied if it's steady state and incompressible. Any point in the flow field. What's the difference in this guy and, and, and the one that we had uh, in chapter Five. Let's go back to chapter five. Let's go to the first part of five. Here it is, conservation of mass for our continental chain. We have the <coughs> fixed control volume. Oh, well, I'll just write it down. Partial with respect to T, rho dB. That was our first term, and the second one was the uh, convective terms, which were our rho, rho V dot N dA. Chapter 5 here with this equation is show me uh, the control volume. Show me the control surface. Okay, I will. Okay, over here, I'm not talking about control volume and control surface. Over here, I'm talking about a point in space and applying the conservation of mass to a very small <coughs> point in space. This little, it's called a differential element, dx by dy. How big is it? dx by dy. How big is dx and dy? Well, they're small. They're real small. That's calculus. In the limit, you know, they go to zero. Yeah. So, this guy, chapter five, you apply to that picture. If somebody says, is conservation of mass satisfied right there at x equal three, y equal four? 
try this guy right here. And you can say yes or no, it's, yes it is, no it's not. So, they're, they're different things. They're both conservation of mass. One's applied to a control volume, the other one's applied to a point in a flow field. Okay, so let's take a look with that then. Let's look at uh, problem 612. For homework, you have, okay, we can go to 612. That's homework. Uh, Maybe we have lost kind of a simplistic one. Let's see, six one. Yeah, we'll do. I think yeah. Let's just go ahead and do six one. I'll do that. Uh, let's see. Do we room? I'll put that over here. Okay, so for a certain incompressible steady, steady, uh, steady flow, incompressible we have uh, u equal to x y given uh, B equal minus X squared Y. Okay, let me go to 612 and look at that and make sure what I've got on there is what I think. 612. Okay. Yeah, he gives us both of those. He, can, he puts W equal, I'll, I'll put it on there anyway, W is zero. We don't need to, it's a 2D, it's a 2D flow field. Uh, okay, In a question. Is it physically possible? Well, of course, we have to check, the first thing you want to do is check conservation of mass. If that's, if that's no go, it's not physically possible. Okay, first of all, step one, it is a steady state. Yeah, he goes to zero. Step two, uh, is it incompressible? Yeah, pull the row outside. Pull the row outside. Now divide through by row. Multiply through by minus one. Plus, plus. There it is done. <clears throat> okay. That's it. Partial U with respect to X. Partial V with respect to Y. Question then is partial U with respect to X plus partial V with respect to Y equal to zero? The answer is 2Y plus X squared equal to zero. No. No. It's not physically possible. Yeah. So that the should so dv and dy be ne uh, negative x squared? Which one? Oh, I didn't see that minus sign there. Thanks, yeah. Thank you. Minus x squared. Thanks. So, <clears throat> thanks. Okay, so that answers that question. Now. It's pretty straightforward. It can be more difficult, of course. It can be more difficult. But in our textbook, in the first Lewis course, it's pretty straightforward. Okay. Um, now, I think that is all I had on that right now. And I think that energy equation, yeah. Okay. That's all I have on that. So let me just talk a little bit about the... Uh,
the exam coming up so you can uh, get prepared for it next week. It's going to cover, as I said before, let, let's recall the first exam. first exam was chapters one and chapters two. That was it. So the um, second exam starts with chapter three. <clears throat> two main things in chapter three. Let's just look real quick and see what those two main things are. Number one, we had F equal MA along a streamline and normal to a streamline. Along a streamline, F equal MA led us to Bernoulli equation. We also have F equal uh, MA normal to a streamline. So those two equations are equations 3, 7 and 3, 12. Okay, 3, 7 and 3, 12. The second part of chapter three, well, it's two things. It talks about what kinds of pressure there are in a problem. And we had on the board, static, dynamic, stagnation, and total pressure. They're all defined in your notes, in the book too. And the rest of that chapter, <clears throat> are examples of Bernoulli's. Thirteen examples. Thirteen examples. Chapter three. You worked 12 for homework. 13 and 12. 25 problems now you work. I worked at least four in class. So you've got about, right now, about 30 problems work to review for the, for the midterm. On Bernoulli's alone, what I worked in class, the ones you worked for homework, and the ones worked out in the textbook. That's a big library of work problems. You don't need to study much else than that for that. Okay, that's chapter three. There will be, of course, one problem out of chapter three on the midterm. Okay. Overall, the total. Static, dynamic, stagnation, total. Okay, now, there'll be nothing on the last sections of chapter three that I mentioned in the course syllabus. Um, no, it's not, but nothing on three, six, sections three, seven, three, eight. Nothing on sections three, seven, and three, eight. Now we go to chapter Four. It's a shorter chapter, but it's a little more difficult maybe to understand. We talk about the velocity field and the accelerations. And we start off talking about the difference in the Eulerian and the uh, Lagrangian approach in fluid mechanics. The Lagrangian approach, you're following fluid particles. The Eulerian approach, you sit at one spot and say what's happening as things go past you. We uh, looked at streamlines, streak lines, and path lines. And you had some homework plotting streamlines and streak lines. And we did several problems in class on the board with streak lines, as you know, and streamlines. Okay. Then we get to the acceleration field. And we define the acceleration field. And we talked about the material derivative the capital D, DT. We talked about the convective acceleration. We talked about the local acceleration. So obviously those are important concepts. And the last part of chapter four talks uh, about the Reynolds transport theorem, which we did a bit. Okay. Seven work examples in there. 
I probably work six, seven in class, that's 14, plus your homework, nine, 14 and nine. That's 23 problems worked on chapter four, either for homework in the textbook or what I worked in class. Lots of problems worked there for you. Oh, by the way, at the end, as I mentioned before, at the end of each chapter, There is a study guide with a table which lists what the author says are the most important equations in that chapter. So again, you'll have that on, on your uh, own uh, equation sheets I give you, which is a table of properties of, of water, oil, and air, and so on. And you'll have them from chapters uh, three, four, five, three, four, and five that table at the very last of the chapter, the chapter summary and study guide. Okay, let's go on. Now we get to chapter five. That's the big one of this. In chapter five, we apply the Reynolds transport theorem to the basic laws of physics. We start off with conservation of mass. for a control line. We talked about how you identify a, a control line, how you draw dashed lines about this control line. That's the first step. Just like in statics, the first thing you do, successful people draw free body diagrams. The same thing holds here. Successful people draw a control line correctly. Then you label the points, and that's not always easy points one, two, or three, if there's multiple places where fluid flows in. Yeah, label the points. Even if you don't get too much else right, at least you get some partial credit on an exam for doing things like that. It shows me you're off in the right direction. So, you know, put down some things on, on, on the paper that you think can get you started, just like I did right here. Label things. Okay. Conservation of mass, all right, fine. Now we move on to momentum. Probably the most difficult topic in all this material for a check for the second midterm. Um, yeah, there's dot products of vectors in there. There's signs of things that can change. Uh, you have to draw the right control volume or it makes life much more difficult when you don't do it. Yeah, it's, 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 it can be difficult. All right, you have the equation. It's pretty simplistic. There's just uh, about one equation there. And, and don't forget, he said that in this, in this first level course, we're going to consider steady state with momentum. So don't worry about non-steady state. Don't worry about the time varying term. He said we're going to consider only steady state and momentum. And then what we did today with the, and last class meeting, last Wednesday, with the energy equation. Of course you should put down all three of those equations on your equation sheet. And Bernoulli's equation, of course you should put down all three equations on your equation sheet for Bernoulli's equation. Because you don't know which one you might use. Typically, one might be easier than another one, the form it's in, whether it's a head form, the power form, the same thing for Bernoulli's. You know, and, and really, can you just write down one, just write down the three equations and they apply for Bernoulli energy? Sure. Take these two guys out, take this guy out, and guess what you got? You got Bernoulli's. If there's no pump, if there's no turbine, if there's no losses, guess what you got? You got Bernoulli's. So how do you modify Bernoulli's? Or the extended Bernoulli, you add mechanical equipment, like a pump, like a turbine, and you know there's going to be losses in the piping network. Now you had the equation for efficiencies. Write those guys down on your equation sheet. How do you find the efficiency of a pump? How do you find the efficiency of a turbine?
Are these losses part of the inefficiencies of turbines and pumps? No. These are the pipe beam losses. This is the amount of power that goes into the, let's say it's water, the amount of power that goes into the water uh, from the pump blades. How much power does it take to drive the pump with a motor? That's where the efficiency comes in. If you multiply the efficiency of the pump by the motor power, that gives you this guy. This guy is the power that goes into the water from the blades of the pump. Same thing here. Turbine. What does a turbine do? The blades take energy out of the water. Then what does the power do? Oh, it typically runs a generator, for instance, or does some useful work. So these losses are only piping losses. The other losses, these two guys come in wrapped up in their definition of what W dot P and W dot T is. Okay, energy equation. Um, yeah. Time here. and 20, 28, 38, 48, minus 4. 44 problems you have there. I've worked at least a dozen in class, 44 and 12. You've got between 55 and 60 problems now in your library of things to study for the second midterm on, on uh, chapter 5 stuff. Wow, 55 problems. Between the problems I worked in class, the ones you worked for homework, and the ones that are worked out in the textbook. That's pretty major. Should you study anything else? I don't see why you should. Because that's where I get my ideas. How do I get my ideas? I say, you know what? I assign that problem for homework. I'm going to tweak it. I'm going to turn it around. I'm going to give you something different and ask you for something different. Or I might change the geometry and momentum. Maybe something came in and turned by 45 degrees. I'll have it come in and go back out this way 45 degrees, not that way 45 degrees, this way 45 degrees. Can you work that problem? Because the signs are critical. Yeah. So that's where I get my ideas, you know. I look at what I, why do I assign those guys for homework? <coughs> because I think they're important. You know, that's why I assign them. Uh, so yeah, that's how you study for the midterm, okay? <laughs>